Introduction to Software Defined Networks, Part 2 The Future of Networking, Now. Hi, this is Daryl Tano of Solutions Reservoir, and thanks for watching Part 2 of this introduction to SDN. Part 1 covered some fundamentals of server and network virtualization, and here's what we'll address in Part 2. Slides for reference have yellow backgrounds. I won't address them, but you may want to pause and read them. Software-defined networks, or virtual networks, were conceived because today's networking is no longer serving our needs. It no longer scales with the pace of change in the virtualized server environment, particularly in network configuration. Management controls and policy implementations are too labor-intensive and coarse. Network functionality itself is limited to what your vendor offers and you've purchased. Also, once you've selected a vendor, you're largely locked into its proprietary feature set. In short, today's networking limits our needs, which is why the SDN alternative is catching on so quickly. Architecturally and operationally, networks and equipment are often divided into planes. The data or forwarding plane is where the actual frame or packet forwarding occurs, and this plane essentially follows instructions provided by the others. As the name suggests, the control plane is where the primary intelligence and complexity of the system reside. It's where the routing or forwarding tables are determined and maintained. The control plane is where complexity, proprietary implementation, and cost all come together, and it exists in every network routing element. These are sometimes called service and management planes. Working with them can require a lot of effort and touch, often on many network elements. This basic architectural approach has been in place for upwards of 35 years, and our needs have outgrown it. Fundamental to software-defined networking is that the control and applications planes are extracted from the network elements and centralized. A consequence of this is that network elements themselves are greatly simplified. Here's our software-defined network with its centralized applications and control planes. The controller is the all-knowing power in an SDN. It self-discovers network topology, determines the routing or flow tables for network elements, automatically translates high-level commands into detailed network-wide execution, and maintains network virtualization. Redundantly configured, the controller runs on commodity servers. So with a small capital expense, the servers and controller performance can be upgraded as needed. It needn't be, but the control network can be a physically separate network, something relatively easy to do in a data center, but less so across a WAN. In an open SDN, the protocol for conveying information between the controller and network elements is OpenFlow, which is steered by the Open Networking Foundation, and network elements adhering to this standard are called OpenFlow Enabled. This standardization underlies the SDN goal of commoditized and competitive network elements. SDN's uptake will be evolutionary, so a software-defined network will interoperate with legacy networks. An interesting uh, attribute of an SDN is that the whole network can appear as a single switch to an adjacent network or switch. For example, these two switches could run MLAG and appear as a single switch to the legacy switch. By the way, the controller could manage the legacy equipment via SNMP. The applications layer in SDN interfaces with the control layer via APIs. While the control vendor will supply many applications, using APIs, an entity could write applications for special needs. For example, this is how a computer science department could define and carve out a virtual network to test a new protocol. The network is presented to a user on a virtual basis, and we'll see how that simplifies things. Let's look at what we have architecturally by noting some features. The infrastructure layer is where we find our switches, OpenFlow enabled or otherwise. Here are some of the features delivered by the SDN control layer. And here are some of the things that occur in the applications layer. You may wish to pause and read this. 
With a virtualized network presentation, a user needn't see any more of his network than necessary. Let's consider a physical network with endpoints A, B, and C, which could even be virtual machines. The logical network is comprised of those elements linking A, B, and C, and on a logical connectivity basis, the SDN will, for example, enable you to specify rules for A, B, and C connectivity as if they were connected to only a single switch. The controller translates those rules into commands and table entries across all network elements, hiding the complexity behind the virtualized presentation. Defining granular, granular flows can be done easily on a network-wide basis in an SDN. In a sense, you convey your high-level needs to the controller, and it executes a network-wide implementation. In this example, we name a specific condition, an IP source address, and destination TCP port, and then define some action, such as priority handling, for traffic matching this condition. These rules and actions would be implemented via flow tables across many network elements. Here's an example of conditional forwarding for traffic between A and B. The latency-sensitive traffic is forwarded along one path, while other traffic is forwarded along another. Note that all the traffic has the same source and destination IP address, so the distinction is made using other factors, such as TCP ports. Here's a data center where all switching elements are OpenFlow enabled under a controller. This includes the virtual switches in the hypervisors, along the lines of the work that NEC did for Windows Server 2012, and what SDN suppliers are doing across all hypervisor platforms. Suppose that the needs of some VMs on Server B are expanding, and what we'd like to do is move, say, this VM to Server C to fully utilize server capacity. This is now easily done, although prior to SDN, moving VMs across subnet boundaries is not impossible was highly impractical. With SDN, the controller manages all desired traffic flows, even creating tunnels if needed. And as the controller is aware of all connectivity paths and their state, all paths, north, south, east, west, can be fully in play. Here's our last example of simplified networking with SDN, virtual tenancy. Each of these customer networks experiences operating as a secure private network. Each customer defines its own VLAN IDs and, as needed, its own IP addresses. The latter is important because many network elements use the same non-routable 192 or 10-dot addressing space, and virtual networks permit such overlapping addressing. This might be important if a customer wanted to move into a public data center and needed to maintain its addressing scheme. We've noted some of the drivers for SDN, and here's a summary of ramifications of SDN already being realized. The bottom line is that SDN is ushering in an era of simplified, more automated, more powerful, and less costly networking. Thanks very much.